How are you? I'm great. Uh, I'm really happy to be able to discuss your epic new movie, uh, Rebel Moon Part 2, The Scargiver, today. Awesome. That, I saw it yesterday, and that is one intense movie. <laughs> cool. <laughs> glad, uh, glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. In Part 1, Korra gather mighty warriors to defend the agricultural world of wealth, and in this one, it's time to go to war. So how would you say this film and the characters have evolved from the first installment of Rebel Moon? Um, what I would say is that, uh, you know, it is, it does pick up straight away. Uh, it was written as a single story and sort of broken in half. And so, uh, you know, the continuity between the two films is quite strong. Um, and so, uh, we, we, um, we go with our heroes, uh, back to the village and uh they learn pretty quickly that the dreadnought is coming after all and that they're gonna have to like um figure out how to stand and fight and so it's a quite a it's quite a problem because of course the mother world forces are so formidable and the dreadnought is really a world destroying machine so i don't know what they're going to do to stop it but they have some tricks up their sleeve you do seem to have a love for pe people fighting against overwhelming odds. I mean, 300 and now this movie? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I don't know. I like an underdog story. I, like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> it's always good, though. It's always good. And how, how would you say you kind of... Um, it's a very complex uh, universe you've created there with, like, mixing sci-fi, fantasy, and also, you have to kind of balance um, exposition and detail, but also maintain a fast-paced narrative. How do you balance those things? That's the real trick, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting because you, you, uh, I think, it, you know, for these PG-13 uh, versions of the movie, you really, it, the, the sort of fast-paced narrative is kind of the main thruster, you know, to keep the movie under two hours was a, um, a request that, that Netflix made to me, and I was like, okay, I can do it. And, uh, you know, so it was, but it, as an interesting sort of exercise. Um, now, that said, uh, you know, and the PG-13 rating, really the, the kind of, they, those two things kind of fuel each other, because a lot of the, you know, the violence is, even though it's, you feel like you're seeing it. A lot of it's kind of like on the cut or off slightly off camera or whatever, you know, like it's a, uh, it's a movie that, that where the violence is certainly you feel like you're seeing a ton of it, but it's all, a lot of it suggested and, or like, you know, the, the actors kind of fall down if they're shot, you know, and there's not really a ton of evidence that they've been hit. Um, so, but uh, I think that when you, uh, See the PG or the R-rated version of the movie. It's a completely made completely in a vacuum with no studio and no, just just us saying that would be cool. Uh, it's a lot more of a the experiences. The movies are both an hour longer, uh, so it's a six-hour fare, and uh, they are also you know, as I said, there are hard R ratings. So I think that you get like, but it's a lot more immersive on all levels. And so I think it, even though it's an hour longer, the pace kind of feels the same as the, as the PG-13. I certainly have plans uh, to watch the R-rated versions. Those sound pretty appealing. <laughs> oh. What would you say is the most satisfying aspect of creating the whole Rebel Moon universe? Yeah, um, it's interesting. Well, I mean, it's incredible to have these giant mythological pieces to move around, you know, as a filmmaker and sort of storyteller. These, those big mythological moves always feel very cosmic and very kind of, uh, you feel like you're sort of at the fabric of the why of reality, um, you know, a little bit as, as, you're, as you're kind of building a world like Rebel Moon and sort of creating mythology that supports it in the creation of the mythology. Of course, it's a reflection on our own mythology on our, and on our own perspective on the world. So a lot of that, hopefully, uh, when you watch these films and with an open mind, 
you can see how we hold a mirror up to ourselves and hopefully we learn from the the sort of morality uh, and the sort of gray morality of our heroes that, uh, you know, black and white is not really a thing. Good point. And, and of course, the main character, Cora or Arthelias, do you have some uh, skeletons in the closet, to say the least? You know, I have been accused of being slightly dark in my um, sort of outlook, but I think that it is all it all kind of culminates with this sort of archetypal mythological sort of spine that runs through all of it. And I think that that's the sort of redeemer at the, the, it's the equalizer is that sort of mythic look that is, um, you know, uh, transcendent, hopefully of like, you know, 20th century morality and it has its own, its own why, but. You know. Everyone loves a good redemption arc. By the way, everyone in this movie is on some sort of redemption arc. Um, you know, even even Gunnar really is on a small redemption arc. Uh, True. For what happened to Sindri? I think that was kind of his fault. Yeah. Um, looking forward, do you have uh, further plans for expanding the Rebel Moon universe? It, there seems to be. I'm not going to spoil anything, of course, but there are some pointers towards some possible future movies in it. Well, of course, we've done um, the outlines and we, we know exactly where the story would go if that was the thing that uh, Netflix uh, thought was a good idea. Uh, so we're ready for that. But in the meantime, we're probably going to do hopefully next up uh, one of the smaller movies because I'm kind of in the mood to not have everything be just a vis visual ex effect extravaganza. It'd be nice to shoot just a movie. Um, so we'll see what we do next. There's a lot of beautiful landscapes and uh, like the setting, for example, the world of wealth. There's a lot of slow mo weeds going on, which is very beautiful. Uh, how has the different locations affected how we tell the movie? There's, there's a lot of planet hopping, but also everything comes back to that agricultural, beautiful little world. Yeah, I mean, we planted this gigantic wheat field uh, that we grew during the course of the movie. Um, we uh, built that village, we, the granary, all the buildings, the longhouse, that's all real, we just shot inside of it, you know, like, uh, and so, um, yeah, it's an interesting, it's interesting to me that like, you know, you do do a lot of world building, but in the end, uh, the actors in that tactile setting, you know, in the longhouse or in the wheat field, you know, scything the wheat, you know, that stuff we just filmed with cameras. It doesn't need a big sci-fi, no green screen, just film. And I think that makes a huge difference for the actors because they get to really, you know, be immersed in the day-to-day -day of the villagers. And I think that that really kind of grounds the movie and it, it makes it kind of easy to photograph against, you know, as a real element, you know, that's the thing that to me sort of lands the film in a, in a very kind of agricultural, you know, it's the little speech that Corey gives, frankly, in movie one where he says, you know, we believe by doing this work by hand, it connects us to the land, you know? And I think that's made sort of physical in movie two. You really get a chance to see them doing that. Oh yes, the farmer's life. Romanticized. Oh yes. Um, you always have a very strong uh, aesthetic, very strong visual striking style. Uh, how did you develop the one for this universe? The shooting style sort of evolved from this concept that I wanted to give the the Netflix viewers uh, the biggest cinematic experience that I could find for them. Um, so no matter if you're watching the movie on your watch or if you're watching it on your 100 inch uh, screen, that you would, that I would deliver you unbiasedly my best and biggest movie I could. Um, so that is my full commitment and effort um, on this movie. Uh, so, uh, but as far as how I came to that uh, style, I mean, visually, um, a lot of it's, honestly, once I started doing tests, a lot of those tests were just intuitive, uh, uh, an, an intuitive exploration of what I naturally think is cool. 
uh, I, I try not to, I try not to um, censor it. I try to really let that be natural and un kind of judged. Uh, and then once I find a land on it, then I stay. Uh, and so, but the explore is the process of exploring is a very, I'm very meticulous, but also, and also very kind of private about why uh, I am, I make choices that I make. That sounds very cool. Yeah. And it looks really good. Oh, good. There's a lot of background. You, you flesh out the backgrounds of several of the characters in, in this movie a lot more, so you get to know them a little bit better. Uh, especially the scar giver, which is kind of the main character. Um, sure. uh, what kind of, without obviously giving spoilers, what kind of revelations would you tease the audience with uh, from this movie? Well, yeah, uh, this movie has quite, I think the revelations in this movie are even uh, scaled uh, quite a bit up uh, because Cora has now gained, is has become more comfortable with Dunar and is willing to like maybe tell them a bit more normal as well as our normal our heroes um there's a scene where they sort of all gather and uh take turns sort of basically relating what happened to them that led them to the basically to this place where they are right now and the stand they're going to take against some other world the reason um that reason is is the reason you know that they're willing to fight and die. Thank you. Uh, it seems time is up, but thank you so much for taking the time to talk to oh, me today. It's been, it's been great.